Well, good morning. Please take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2. And we will be looking today at verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And please follow along with me as I read. When he, being Jesus, had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Let's pray. Father, thank you for such a rich passage of scripture. Thank you for including this great narrative in this in your canon in the Gospel of Mark. And I pray now that I would just be your servant and would be able to communicate your truth in a way that is clear and accurate and helpful to all who are here. Bless this time, Lord. Bring fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, about 10 years ago, I received a phone call from a friend of mine. His name is Craig Cabe. He works for Fellowship of Christian Athletes, as I do, in the state of Indiana and lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana there. And he was calling me to ask me if I would speak at an event, an FCA event, with the Indiana Pacers. Um, It was going to be held on the practice court of the the arena there, formerly known as Conseco Fieldhouse. And um, I love Craig K. because Craig was always calling me, giving me opportunities to speak, to preach. Uh, He's had me speak at different FCA camps for him in the summer in Indiana, Uh, Several years ago, he asked me to speak at chapel for Notre Dame, which was great, uh, a Protestant chapel, and getting to meet some of those players and be on the campus. And now he was giving me an opportunity to speak at an event with the Indiana Pacers. So he told me about the event. FCA was expecting about 700 kids and coaches to attend this event. And the event was to take place between 6 to 6.45 p.m., And we had to be done at 6.45 p.m. because there were going to be some ushers from the Indiana Pacers coming and escorting all the kids and the coaches to their seats. So we had to be done so that they could get to their seats by the 7 o'clock tip-off. So Craig gave me a challenge. He asked me if I could share the gospel in eight minutes. I told him I could do it. But I had a lot of fun with it. We were good friends. And I said, listen, if you're only giving me eight minutes, I've got to cut something. So I could either cut sin or I could cut Christ out of my presentation. (laughs) And we had a nice laugh about that. And, you know, the great thing is it was a good challenge for me. And the good news is you can share the gospel in eight minutes. You can really share it in five. And uh, really giving a simple message, starting with the holiness of God, his character, and then talking about the sinfulness of man, but then talking about the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our place, and how faith in Christ alone brings salvation. So when I got to Conseco Fieldhouse, which is now called Banker's Life Fieldhouse, um, Craig greeted me with some great news. He goes, Kirby, you've been upgraded. You now have 10 minutes. It's like, wow, now I can like give an illustration or tell a story or something. Man, I was pumped up. And um, well, 
I was grateful for that news, but once the band started playing, uh, I thought, this is not going to go well. They just were not on a time schedule, and uh, nothing about musicians, Doug. I'm just saying, they just didn't care about the time. And uh, so I was kind of watching the clock, and it, was, it went from 10 to 9, and by the time I got up to speak, I had five minutes. And, um, but you know what? The gospel was shared. And I could take comfort in knowing that God's word went forth and the promise that God gives us in his word that his word will go forth and will accomplish whatever he desires. Amen? And uh, that it will not return void. And so as I prepared to preach this week and prayed about what I should speak on, what I would preach on, and, and I looked over this passage here in Mark chapter 2 and I worked through the outline again, I thought about all of you, I thought about this church, and I thought, maybe this is too simple, and asked the question, how will this benefit growing believers? This is a mature congregation, you are well taught. But as I read through the passage again, I was reminded again of the simplicity of the gospel message. And in this passage today, we get a clear look at the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there really is no need to make any apology, but only to enjoy the reminder of the goodness of God and the salvation that he has provided through the gospel of grace. So I pray that our hearts would be encouraged today, that we would be reminded of the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness that God has brought to every one of us who are in Christ. So today I would like to give you four facts about forgiveness so that we would be reminded of that very forgiveness that we have In Christ Jesus. Four facts about forgiveness that we would be reminded of the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ. Number one, we see that forgiveness is accessed through faith. Forgiveness is accessed through faith. In verse one, we are told by Mark that Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, and it was heard that he was at home. Now, when you think about home, Jesus, as most Bible commentators would tell us, probably lived during, with Peter during his earthly ministry. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 13, we read that, And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Verse 2, we learn, it says that, And many were gathered together, So that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 45, you will see why there are so many people gathered. Verse 45, this is uh, the account of the healing of the leper. Verse 45 says, but he went out, the leper went out, and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. This is amazing, isn't it? The word was spreading, no social media, but everyone knew about this man who was claiming to be God, who was healing people of their diseases, and people wanted to come and to see him and witness this in person. Even in Capernaum, which was a fishing town on the Sea of Galilee, his fame was spreading and the crowds were growing. Well, what was he doing with those who had gathered at the house? Mark tells us here that he was speaking the word to them, and this was the very thing that Jesus came to do. If you look back in chapter 1 of verse 38, um, actually start in verse 35, in the early morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. He said to them, Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby, so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. So Jesus came to preach, and that is what he is doing here at the house in Capernaum. Verse 3, And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So this man was paralyzed, he was lying on a bed, he had to be carried to Capernaum, to the house, by four of his friends. 
Jesus had healed such people before. We read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, that the news about him spread throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, paralytics, and he healed them there. Verse 4, there's a problem though as these men arrive, being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. So in Israel, during the time of Christ, many homes had flat roofs that were used for relaxation in the cool of the day and for sleeping on really hot nights. And this roof, like many others, was made of slabs of dried clay. They were placed on supporting beams that stretched from one end of the house to the other. So these four men took him to the roof of what we would believe is Peter's house and dug out that top coat of clay which was put down as a seal against rain. Would have been neat to see how well that would have held up this week after all the rain here in Maryland. But they would have removed the several, several of the slabs of the dried clay until they had enough room to lower his cot down into the house and into the presence of Jesus himself. Quite a scene. In verse 5, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, Your sins are forgiven. Mark says here that Jesus, seeing their faith. Matthew does the same in his gospel. What do we know about the word there? It's plural. Mark does not say when Jesus saw his faith. He says when he saw their faith. This is, not an, this is not a misprint in your Bible. This is not an error. Please don't tear out Mark chapter 2 from your Bibles, okay? And I want us to take a little time here to examine the faith of these four men. First of all, we see their willingness to take him to Jesus. This, as we see in these first four verses, required much effort. It involved travel. We don't know how far they came. Mark doesn't tell us that. But it would have required strength to carry a man on his bed and to get him up on the roof and then to be able to lower him down. As a pastor, I have had the honor of doing many weddings and a few funerals. I had a great streak going at one time. We had a young church. I had, I had done 14 weddings and zero funerals. I was like, I like this. I like live things rather than dead things. And so um, that that is... Uh, that gap has, has um, shortened a little bit now. I've done a few funerals. And I really enjoy being asked to, to come to a funeral and, and preaching and doing the ceremony. I've never been asked to be a pallbearer. Please don't ask me. That, that really terrifies me. I would be the guy that, I'm going down. You know, I wouldn't be able to hold my part. I'm, I'm not very strong. And, uh, but just think about what these guys are doing, their willingness to get him to Jesus. Secondly, we see their persistence in taking him to Jesus. They had to fight the crowds. Mark tells us here that there was no room in the house, not even beside the door. It would have been very easy to get discouraged and just go home and say, hey, we'll, we'll catch him another time. Thirdly, we see their hard work in taking him to Jesus. That is found in verse 4. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. These guys were determined. They worked very hard to get to Jesus. Now, we don't have a record of this in the Gospels, but I'm pretty sure Peter, and we know that Peter would have been a source for Mark's writing of his Gospel Peter, who was never short on words, whose mouth often got him in trouble, probably said, hey, that's my roof. You're going to pay for this. All right. These four men climbed onto the roof. They got the man there with his bed. They cut out some clay. They removed some slabs and they somehow lowered him to get to Jesus. Again, this is one of these things that I hope in heaven is on DVD and we can see this event. How did they do this? It's amazing. This is great dedication. And I just would ask you, do you have any friends like this? Did you have friends like this who were determined to tell you about Jesus? 
And are you a friend like that to those who don't know Christ? That you'll do whatever you can to get them to Jesus. I do believe that the faith of the paralytic is included in the there here. For he either asked to be taken to Jesus or at least was willing to be taken to Jesus if they asked him, can we take you to him? And Jesus here sees the faith of these four men and he sees the faith of the paralytic. And he says in verse five to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus personalized this. He says, your sins, that is not plural. It is in the second person singular. He is speaking directly to this paralyzed man. Well, why would Jesus do this? We don't know, we don't know the motive behind the four men bringing their friends so that he could be, we don't know that they necessarily brought him for forgiveness. I believe we can infer that they brought him because they heard that Jesus was in Capernaum and they believed that their friend could be healed. Well, Jesus begins here because many Jews living during the time of Christ believe that all disease and all affliction was a direct result of one's own sin. We have some who would like to teach that in the church today, many who would believe this. In John chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, we read this passage that as he passed by, Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he would be born blind. And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so here we see Jesus forgiving the sins of the paralytic by simply saying to him, son, your sins are forgiven. What incredible words. Words of life, forgiveness. And we are reminded in this passage that forgiveness is accessed through faith. This man had faith. He believed that Jesus could heal him. He wanted to see Jesus, and Jesus saw his faith and forgave him of all of his sins. And that is what happens when we placed faith in Christ. That is what happens when we place faith in Christ today. If you are not yet a believer, our sins are forgiven, and we are declared to be righteous. Romans 5, 1, Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, belief, entrusting yourself to Jesus Christ. Faith brings forgiveness, faith alone. It's been 13 years since Pope John Paul II died. That was in April 2005. I was pastoring in Indiana at that time, and I remember getting a phone call from someone in our church shortly after the Pope died asking me, is the Pope in heaven or in hell? Well, according to every cardinal and every priest and even Pat Robertson, the doors of heaven were swung open and the Pope was welcomed into heaven. Note, I want to point this out that today only the Pope and the Lord really know and the people who are there where he is right now. One place where he is not is purgatory, because there is no such place. There are two destinations. There is heaven and there is hell. But according to the world standards, Pope John Paul II was a good man. He was a champion of freedom all around the world. But like you and me, yes, even a pope, he was born a sinner in need of a savior. And we learn in Hebrews that it is impossible, without faith, it is impossible to be pleasing to God. John Paul II had to come to a place in his own life where he acknowledged his sinfulness and placed his faith in Christ for salvation. Everyone must come to Christ through faith. We are all in need of forgiveness. Whether you are a pastor's son or a pastor yourself, or a paralytic or a pope, a murderer, or even Mary, the mother of Jesus. We are in dire need of forgiveness, and that forgiveness is accessed through faith, faith alone. Jesus here, seeing their faith, seeing his faith, there's no talk of works here. Do you see that? Do you see what's not there? There's no talk of works. There's no mention of anything he had done. 
Faith brought forgiveness. Faith brought salvation. Number two, we see in this passage that forgiveness is available through God. Forgiveness is available through God. Verses six and seven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, the paralytic, think about him for a minute. He had to be elated. Before he ever took a step, he had been forgiven of all of his sins. The four men had to be excited. They loved their friend and their friend who they have gone to the Old Testament. They were familiar with the prophet Isaiah. We read in Isaiah 43, 25, the Lord says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. These scribes understood that only God could forgive sin, and they understood that God would one day accomplish this through the work of his servant. But what they didn't understand was that day had now come. This Jesus was the promised Messiah. He was also the one who would be the suffering servant who Isaiah wrote about in Isaiah 53, 6. that says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. They did not know that they were sitting in the presence of God himself. They underestimated the power of this rabbi, this teacher. Verse 8, immediately, Mark's favorite word, immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? When you read this in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 9, 4, it says, Jesus, knowing their thoughts. Jesus was fully man, but he was also fully God. He was omniscient. He knows even the thoughts of men. And we see this throughout the the Gospels. We see it in Matthew 12, John chapter 2, and Luke chapter 7. Friends, forgiveness is available through God and through God alone. Not through Mary, not through the saints, not through a pastor or a priest. God alone has the power and the authority to forgive us of our sin. Thirdly, forgiveness is accomplished by Christ. Forgiveness is accomplished by Christ. Look at verses 9 through 11. Jesus continues speaking to these scribes and says, Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. The scribes asked a question here, under their breath, in their own minds. And so Jesus, being a good rabbi, answered their question with a question. That's what rabbis would do, and we see Jesus doing this often in the Gospels. So Jesus asked the the scribes a question. He he asked his question out loud, however, saying, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? Anyone could say, anyone could say with their mouths, your sins are forgiven. Any false teacher, anyone claiming to be God could utter those words. But Christ had the authority to forgive sin. Because he was God. The father had bestowed on him that power, that authority. His sacrificial death on the cross would secure the forgiveness of everyone who would ever believe on him. Jesus is not a liar here. He's not a lunatic by saying your sins are forgiven. Jesus did not need to do one more thing that day. The man came to Jesus guilty and he could now leave guiltless and forgiven. But, verse 10, Jesus says, So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus wanted others to believe in him. 
He says, but there's a transition here. So that you may know the son of man, which I believe is Jesus favorite designation for himself. We see that throughout the gospel of Luke. That you may know that he has the authority to speak such words to forgive sin. He says to the paralytic and he gives him here three commands. Number one, he says, get up, get off your bed. He is telling him and commanding him to do something that he was unable to do when he came down the hole of the roof. Secondly, he says, pick up your pallet. Pick up the very bed that you have been lying on. The bed that your four friends carried you in on and lowered you on to the roof. And then he says, go home. Much like the healing of the leper in chapter one, see that you tell no one. I'm just thinking about this paralytic. Go home? Are you kidding? Can't I stay and hear you teach? Do you mind if I dance a little bit while I'm here? We see that this was no show. This was not a staged event. Nothing like you would see on Christian television. This was a miraculous work that could not be denied. When you look at the miracles of Jesus, there are three characteristics every time. They are undeniable, they are instantaneous, and they are spectacular. And we see that here as well. All of those who were there to witness this great event, they saw the man before he was healed. They saw him as a paralyzed man, unable to move. And they saw the work of his four friends. The scribes and all those who were in the house witnessed the supernatural. There could be no denial. And we see that in verse 12, where we read that he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. The man obeyed Jesus, didn't he? He got up and went home. The miracle spoke for itself by him getting up and picking up the very bed he came in on and walking out of the house. Just think about this. He was lowered into the house from the roof, but he walked out the front door. How do you deny such a miracle as this? Well, again, we don't have this recorded in the Gospels, but I'm pretty sure the man looked up, saw the big hole in the roof, and said to Jesus, Oy vey, what about the roof? And Jesus replied, It's okay, I'm a carpenter on the side. All right? That's not true, okay? That's not... Just having fun here. Please don't go report me, all right? (laughs) Forgiveness has been accomplished through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone. It was the thief on the cross who called out to Jesus for salvation. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peter continued that message message in Acts 4 where he said there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Paul told Timothy, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Forgiveness is accomplished by Christ and Christ alone. Only Jesus was born of a virgin. Only Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. Only Jesus is God incarnate. Only Jesus died a death that satisfied the wrath of Almighty God. Only Jesus can get you to the Father. Forgiveness. It is accessed through faith. It is available through God. It is accomplished by Christ. Fourthly, we see forgiveness is accompanied by rejoicing. Forgiveness is accompanied by rejoicing. Verse 12 Again, he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. When the crowd saw this, they were not just impressed. They didn't just clap or high five one another. I doubt they did that. But they marveled. They were astonished. And they were glorifying God. Not only that, but they were awestruck. 
In Matthew chapter 9, verse 8, we read this. When the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. Forgiveness, when we truly understand, when we have been forgiven by Jesus Christ, it will be accompanied by rejoicing here on earth as displayed here and even in heaven. Luke 15, 7 says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. When is the last time you stopped and rejoiced over your salvation? When is the last time you thought about how much God has forgiven me of and rejoiced and gave glory to God? We also need to rejoice with those who come to Christ through faith in Christ. We should celebrate with them for they too have been forgiven. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life and they will never face the awful torments of hell. So just a reminder to us today in this great passage, we see this incredible truth about forgiveness. It is access through faith through faith in Jesus Christ, and through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It is available through God. God is the one who forgives us of our sins. Jesus must be God because only God can forgive sin. And Jesus claimed to be God. He, he claimed to be God in the flesh, and he forgave people of their sins. It is accomplished by Christ, by his work on the cross that he lived a perfect life in our place and died an atoning death for our sins that we might be forgiven. And it is accompanied by rejoicing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your forgiveness that you have brought to us, to all of us who are in Christ. Lord, I pray even now for those of us who have not stopped for a long time to think about who we were, that we were dead in our sins, that we were subject to the evil rule of Satan, that we were children of wrath, that we were walking according to the course of this world, and that we were unable to change our dreadful condition. But God, You made us alive when we were dead because of your great love with which you loved us. By grace, we have been saved. We have been forgiven of all of our sins. They have been cast as far as the east is from the west. Lord, you tell us in your word that you remember our sins no more. And Lord, that's not because you're forgetful or dumb or ignorant. It's because you are gracious. And Lord, you will not hold our sins against us. Our sins were buried when Christ died for them on the cross, when he bore them in his own body on the tree. So Lord, we thank you. Cause us to be men and women, boys and girls, those of us who know you, that we would rejoice in the salvation you have brought to us. Lord, give us boldness in this area of the country where we live that we would open our mouths and speak the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, that it's through him and through him alone, that it is by faith and by faith alone, faith apart from works, that, Lord, salvation is found in Jesus and not in Mary. It is found in Christ and not a system. It is found in the person of Jesus and not in a pope or any other man. Thank you for the clarity of your word, Lord. You make it so clear to us how we are to be saved. And I would pray if there's anyone here today, Lord, that has never repented of their sin and trusted in you and given their lives to you and acknowledged their own sin and their need of a Savior, that today might be the day where they come to you. Lord, you tell us that we are not guaranteed tomorrow, that today is the day of salvation. And so, Lord, we would pray you would be merciful and gracious to do in them what you have done in us and that they would be able to give you glory and that we would be able to rejoice with them. Thank you for your word, that it 
You promise it will not return void, but it will accomplish whatever you desire. And so, Lord, find a place for it in each of our hearts today, and may it find its way to our lips that we would declare the goodness of the Lord in each of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.